Let our hearts not be hardy To those living on the margins There is room at the table for everyone This is where it all begins This is how we gather in There is room at the table for everyone Glad you're here for our first gathering. I hope you'll invite others to come with for the next one as well. And we have awesome food outside. I'm going to get untangled just one second. Maybe not. Can you help me, please? So August is the month. August is the month to celebrate many things. This is something that my youngest child has gotten really into asking Alexa every day. Like, did you know there's a day for everything too? Like, actually for multiple things. And so I thought we'd just begin with a little trivia about August. Um, and so first, August is National Dog Month. So what, here's your first, uh, we're going to do a little meme trivia. Um, when your phone battery is at 6% and it dies anyway. Um, what type of dog is this? Yes, someone said it. Yay, okay. Um, next, this is National Black-Owned Business Month. So I, I don't know if y'all know this. This is a local Austin business company owned by a black woman called Soul Popped. First of all, if you have not ever had it, 
It is the most amazing. They have a popcorn flavor called chicken and waffles. <laughs> and it's like, it's like low sugar, low, it's low fat. It's like this healthy snack. It's a great gift to give people. Um, so anyway, they actually have a um, pop-up shop in Barton Creek Mall. Um, but so anyway, this is what, it made me think about popcorn. <laughs> what is it called? Well, you know when you do your, your microwave popcorn bag and there are the ones that don't pop. What are those called? Yes! Good job, Paul Becker. There's actually, or, or, he said old maids, or they're called spinsters. Did you know that there's a name for the unpopped popcorn kernels? Um, third, August is Children's Eye Health and Safety Month. I love this meme. I don't know what you're putting in these bottles, but keep them coming. So babies spend half of their time when they're sleeping in a type of sleep called REM sleep. Who knows what REM stands for? Rapid eye movement. So stay with me. Stay with me. Um, who is the lead singer of the band REM? Michael Stipe. And what city and state did the band REM start in? Yes! Athens, Georgia. Go Bulldogs. Okay, our last trivia is that August is get ready, get ready for kindergarten month. Teaching kindergarten the first week is like having a blender without a lid. How many of you remember the name of a kindergarten, your kindergarten teacher? That's not that many of us, because I don't remember the name of the kindergarten teacher. We are so glad y'all are here. I'm going to turn it over to Stacy, and she's going to share a little bit with us. Well, thank you guys for being flexible with us. This isn't quite how we plan this fall, but then nothing is quite <laughs> like we plan in the fall. Um, for the very first time in my time here, and that's all I can say, Lord knows what happened here years ago, but for the first time in seven years, we are trying during the month of August for every age group in our church to be studying the same thing during Sunday school. And, it, and uh, Emily has even uh, agreed to be preaching the same thing in the sermons. So um, this was going to be our first experience using a Presbyterian curriculum called Welcome All. And so downstairs right now, um, both the little bitty children and the older children and the youth um, are, are actually taking the same theme that you heard in the sermon. Um, and they are studying God's welcome today. And so we, as adults, we're going to do the same thing in some format. Well, this is the format we're going to do for the next three weeks. It seems safe to us to all be together like this. Um, and what I want to do is just introduce a little bit of what the lesson would have been if we'd been together and have a little bit of discussion before we go and enjoy some breakfast. So I want to begin um, with a tiny short video by the author of this curriculum, the woman who wrote the curriculum for the entire month. She's a Presbyterian pastor, and I'm going to let her introduce herself and introduce the topic to you. My name's Lynn Bob. People always wonder how to pronounce my last name, but it rhymes with sob cars. So that's a good mnemonic device. So I'm a writer, teacher, Presbyterian minister. The main thing I do right now is writing. And it was a huge privilege to get to write for the Follow Me curriculum. So the first focus in the Follow Me Hospitality lesson is a focus on welcoming others as God welcomes us. And the journey is back to creation, back to the fact that human beings are created in God's image. 
uh, the scripture that we use is Psalm 8. What are humans that you are mindful of them? The sense that God made us and yet God is mindful of us. It's not that we're scurrying around um, unattached to God or unwelcomed by God, but in every way over and over God welcomes us. God welcomes us by providing this abundant, beautiful world that we live in, and God welcomes us by um, continuing to be in a relationship with us over and over. We also use the Leviticus 19 passage about loving the alien as yourself. Woven all through the Old Testament are passages where we, we are exhorted over and over to welcome strangers, welcome aliens, welcome widows, welcome orphans, and we provide care to people who we consider to be on the margins because God provides care to us. So that's the first lesson in hospitality uh, has to do with welcoming people. And we might do this on a practical level in our church buildings by the signage that we have up. I taught a, a course once on church communication and I had people look at the physical welcome that their church building provided. And oh my goodness, the students came back to me and said, oh my, our building's not welcoming at all. How could anyone find the bathrooms? How would anyone know where to go? And in fact, when they walk into the church building, all they see is a whole bunch of clutter in the lobby. Oh, maybe we should clean that up. So there's this whole sense of, of an invitation to explore the physical welcome provided by a church. This might also include welcomes during the worship service in different languages, um, welcoming people with disabilities in a way that provides for them, removing a pew so that people who uh, are in a wheelchair would have a place to sit. So the first lesson invites us to consider the ways that we as a church, we as smaller groups within the church, affirm that God has welcomed us and so therefore we welcome others. Lovely, lovely. Um, so you can see that you're, if you have children downstairs, I know some of you do, when they come home with uh, Genesis 1 and 2, murals and pictures of animals and you're going I thought we were talking about welcome all you understand that this was the way that they thought would be the best way to start talking to children about God's welcome the fact that we have this world created for us and that they as children and as young people have a place in this world is the beginning um, the the beginning place and it's obviously the beginning of our scripture too that God creates a welcoming place um, now that gets more complicated uh, as time goes on and one of the things that I want to um, just remind you of and this is a quote uh, from the curriculum hospitality um, isn't just something nice right it isn't just something extra that we should do if we have the time and the energy it isn't just a kind of a um, wrapping a bow or putting a nice icing on what we do Hospitality is actually to create a safe and open place. And that's important. When you walk in some place and you feel it feels hospitable, it's because it's safe and because it's open. And it's a place where a friend or a stranger can enter and experience, in our case, the welcoming spirit of Christ. A safe place, an open place where a stranger can walk in and experience the welcoming spirit of Christ. And so all of a sudden, instead of just being something nice to do, this actually is not an option. It is actually who we are as the church. And that's exactly, if you were here at 9.30, at 9 o'clock, you heard Emily preach that from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. If you're, gonna, if you're coming to the late service, you'll hear that in a minute. It is not an option. It is who we are as a church. Um, and this welcome that we've received in Christ is the welcome that we are to share with the world. You know, that, 
as I was reading the curriculum and thinking about this, I thought, well, that's really not that complex. I mean, it's not a, a difficult idea, is it? God has created a safe, open place for us, created this household, um, the kind of mysterious, buildingless household of faith. And so we welcome others. Uh, look at our mission statement. I believe it's right here. Um, we invite others into God's larger story as we follow Christ together. Um, what I want to... Um, what I want to ask you is, is this a statement of hospitality? Is this just a matter of, well, if people come to us, we'll be nice to them. Is that what it sounds like? I, I see some heads shaking. No. There's something a little more active here, isn't there? There's something a little more intentional here. This whole welcoming thing, welcoming all, may mean more than picking up the clutter in our narthex. Though, let me say, picking up in the clutter in the narthex is a good thing, right, Emily? We like it. But all of a sudden, it's like we've gone from hospitality 101, you know, if people come to the building, at least shake their hand and smile at them, to hospitality 301. How do you go out into the community, go uh, into your family, into your work, into your school, and do this? That's hospitality at a whole nother level. And if we had the time, and we're doing the lesson as it was written, one of the, the things to think about really has to do with superiority and power. Okay? And I'm going to just do this in 30 seconds. When we are here on a Sunday morning and we are welcoming others into our building, who has the power? Who has the superiority? I mean, not that we see ourselves as superior, but this is what? Our place, right? Inviting others into God's larger story in the real life, in real world, where we spend the majority of our time is not a place of superiority, is it? It's not a place of power, it's a place of being equals. And that is where, as adult and mature Christians, the welcoming spirit of Christ really, I think, as my father, 85-year-old father, that's where that rubber hits the road, that my dad says that all the time. Um, that's, that's where it really is. Um, I think when we say we invite others into God's larger story as we follow Christ together, it is a statement of hospitality, but it's also a statement of lifestyle, of intention, of purpose. It's really as much a statement of who God is as it is who we are. The emphasis is more on God. It's God's story, right? Not our story. And we simply get to invite people into it. And it's a statement of who we are. Um, I'm going to be real honest. When we started using this, this old mission statement again, um, when we found it and started reusing it, at first, it didn't have a lot of oomph for me. Can I just be honest about that? I'm like, that's nice. You know, that's nice. Invite people into God's larger story. But we've been saying it every week now for quite a while. And as we keep saying it, I keep thinking about how large that story really is. So much larger than I ever dreamed or imagined. And that's the point. That we can't see the whole story um, and are still given this privilege. And the Apostle Paul would call it a privilege, a treasure of inviting people into it as it continues to unfold. And as we do it together. Um, I, I don't want to preview the sermon for 11 o'clock, but there were some awesome examples that Emily gave of community. And so listen in her sermon um, as she reminds us of C.S. Lewis's vision of hell in The Great Divorce, because C.S. Lewis's vision of hell in The Great Divorce is simply being alone. She'll, she'll tell it better than that. But it's simply not having community. And this ability to be able to follow Christ together, to not be alone. 
um, is a precious gift, and it's a gift that we have to offer the world. There's a lot more that we could say about that. I want to back up a little bit and talk about the one thing we do have a lot of control over. Because when it comes to our individual lives, you and the Holy Spirit will figure out at work, with your family, with your neighbors, how that inviting is going to look. You and the Spirit have to figure out where that hospitality, that safe place for strangers to experience God's uh, welcome, how that's going to happen. But when we're here on a Sunday morning, we have a lot of control. We have a ton of control over how welcoming we are as the body of Christ. Um, and right out there where those doors are and that little space, which we try to keep cleaned up, Emily tries real hard to keep cleaned up, um, that's where it happens. Most church uh, literature says it takes six seconds for people to walk into a North Ever Church and make a decision. That's not very long. Another thing that I read said the three minutes right before worship and the three minutes right after worship are the six most important minutes in the service for a newcomer. Um, and we do have control over that and how, how we act. So I have um, a little video just to get us thinking a little bit about that. Hi there. Welcome to your church. Today, I'd like to talk with you about becoming a more welcoming church. Back here, we've got Jack and Sally and little Jack Jack, and they're first time guests today. Hi. You guys ready? We got a bit of a hike. Let's do it, please. Most church members don't see their churches clearly. They think of their churches as friendly, open, welcoming. But when guests were surveyed, they typically saw church members as unfriendly, and they certainly didn't feel welcomed. Hello. The perception chasm existed because church members were indeed friendly to one another. Guests felt like they were crashing a private party. Should we get Jack Jack checked in? For instance, while you feel your church is homey and everyone knows each other, without clear security safeguards, guests may find those same areas creepy, or worse yet, unsafe. Nope. See you in worship. The problem is church isn't the country club. It's a place for broken people to come together and become a family. <clears throat> also, don't be boring. <laughs> um, I, I love showing this, um, and, and I'm really very proud of our congregation in a lot of ways. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, at a Presbytery meeting about a year and a half ago, uh, Teresa Ward, our own Teresa Ward, the most hospitable, welcoming person I know. She's not here, by the way. There she is. She's busy getting ready for us to have hospitality at breakfast. That's how our Teresa is. So Teresa was asked to teach a workshop to a bunch of other churches about hospitality and welcome because um, the Presbytery felt like we, we did a good job of it, right? And she did a great workshop. We got to the very end, and um, most of the churches there, you know, have about 100, 200 people in them. They're much smaller churches than ours. And someone actually raised his head and said, well, that's, that's well and good for you and Westlake Hills Presbyterian Church because you've got staff to be welcoming. And um, it caught Teresa and I off guard, but it also made me think it's not the staff that make this church welcoming. I mean, we help. But that's not what makes this place welcoming. I'm just wondering, I know you've got masks on and you're far apart, but I'm wondering, in all honesty, um, what your experience has been in terms of welcome here at our church. 
um, and how you're not, we're not going to take it personally, uh, Teresa and Emily, and Emily and I, but what has your experience been here at our church? What do you think we do well? What do you think we could do better? Anyone? Yes, sir. Well, I'm glad to hear that, too, because that was not that long ago. It was just a few years ago, right? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I don't even think we had a senior pastor on your very first Sunday here, I, I think. I think we were between pastors, maybe, or, or close to between pastors. That's right. That's good. What else? Yeah, yeah, Robin? No, you, Robin, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and she's still doing that as a deacon today. That's right. That's awesome. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> the rest was history after that. That's right. That's awesome. That's, it just happened to run into choir people, too. That's awesome, you know. <laughs> that was a quick grab, Emily Craven. <laughs> but, you know, those stories, though, show how important those first moments in a church really are. Um, and one of the things that, because I'm looking at you guys, and you guys are like our committed, for the most, you know, committed church members. One of the things a committed church member can do without being a deacon or a greeter or anything else is those three minutes after the post loop, as people are getting up and leaving, just if everyone were to find just one face that they don't quite recognize and introduce yourself. Because those minutes, those three minutes from the pew to the front door, um, are really important golden minutes. You just talked about both of you. It was in those minutes right after worship that some connections were made, and that's something we certainly could do. It's hard right now with, obviously, this isn't going to be the fall where we're going to be welcoming hundreds of people to the church, right, and, and, and doing the way, and that's okay. It's still good for us to think. So I have some homework for you. Um, we're going to go on out and have breakfast and um, in a safe place. Um, but I have a little homework for you that I want you to think about um, as we continue this study next week. And that is, imagine the next time you walk into this building that you are brand new. Imagine you've never been here before. Imagine, uh, imagine that you're not who you are. Let's say if, if you're my age, imagine that you're a young uh, mom with a couple of little kids. Um, or, if you are young and spry, imagine yourself mobility impaired, okay? Um, try it on, do a little mental exercise, and see how the building, how the welcome, how um, the signage, how things feel uh, from that perspective. Um, because I think that that's really good, um, including those of you who are taking kids downstairs, think about that. Think about what that might be like for some of um, our newcomers um, so that we can uh, make a real effort to do those easy things that we can do to be the community that really, honestly, we all want to be. Am I right? Um, I'd like to close with um, a prayer and then Emily has a song for us. This is going to be our theme song uh, for, uh, for the next three weeks. So would you pray with me, please? God, we are grateful for this place. So grateful for your word proclaimed, um, challenging us to be the body of Christ. Grateful that these people have come to gather and continue to learn what it means to be welcoming. 
God, help us to understand that this is not just something nice to do, but this is absolutely who we are called to be as your people in every place in our lives. And help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if Tom can put those words up. This, is, this song is called God Welcomes All. And I'm going to play it and sing it for you once, and then I want you to join me. All right? So here, this is how it goes. God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. Think you can do it? Let's stand and give it a try. One, two, here we go. God welcomes all strangers and friends. God loves his strong. Well done. Friends, we have a great breakfast, plenty of space, lots of open air right out that door. So please come join us. You're all welcome.